Hey folks, Alex here from Any Given Saturday and today I'm joined by special teams coordinator for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, Jeff Reinbold. Jeff has been coaching football for over 40 years, working the Canadian Football League, NFL Europe and college football. At the college level, Jeff has coached at SMU, Hawaii and Louisiana Tech along with a number of other universities all over America. He began his coaching career as the quarterbacks and wide receivers coach at Western Montana Community College. Whilst at Hawaii, Jeff was named one of the nation's top 20 recruiters by the college football recruiting site Rivals. And uh, no doubt NFL fans in the UK watching this will recognise Jeff from his work as an NFL analyst for Sky Sports and his time working in NFL Europe. Jeff, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, it's my pleasure, man. It's great to see you. And what is up with all of that LSU gear behind you, man? Yeah, do you want to know the story quickly about how I became an LSU fan? <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, so I'd been a, a Saints fan for uh, since I'd say sort of the back end of the 2015 season, then sort of got into them a lot more in 2016. And uh, I was sort of learning more about college football and uh, obviously needed to, to pick a team. And I was just falling more and more in love with the Saints and Louisiana and the culture and the history and things like that. And so I just thought, well, if I'm a Saints fan, why don't I pick a university in Louisiana? And then, obviously, of course, with the, you know, the, the players that uh, get drafted from L LSU, you know, they, they're a big name program, so uh, so they're kind of recognisable from that respect. And uh, I just love the colours, and um, yeah, so really, sort of from the uh, 2017 season, um, I just sort of became an LSU fan, and since then, it's just steadily grown and grown and grown. And now I'm a massive fan. I don't miss any games, whether they're on at 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. <laughs> I keep up with every little bit of recruiting news, all the roster news, everything. And uh, yeah, so that's sort of the short story of how I became an LSU fan. All right. Then if you're an LSU fan, then you have to be able to do a, uh, we call him Bebe, but uh, Coach Ogeron yeah. Is, yeah. is such a character. Give me one little bit of Coach Ogeron. His, his voice. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, I know, because it would be blasphemy if I did it. I'd, I'd feel really bad if I have to meet him one day. <laughs> well, son, you gotta, son, you got to come down to LSU, uh, LSU <laughs> with the Tigers. You know what? I, I, I got a great LSU story. When I was a kid, <clears throat> my dad had gone to school in Mississippi, and so as a kid, he, you know, we were, he was always a big fan of SEC football, and we would listen. Big radio station out of New Orleans that you could get uh, basically anywhere around the country at night on Saturday night. And you'd listen to LA. We, you know, we had five kids and not much money. So we big night, big Saturday night was driving around in the station wagon with five kids, go to get a nickel root beer at a and W, which is a little root beer about that big and listen to LSU football games. And, and when the tigers would score, it'd be so loud in death Valley that you couldn't even hear the announcer, right? That's how crazy it was. So when I was at Louisiana tech, we played them. And we're going to play them down there in their homecoming. This is when Saban was there. And um, <clears throat> so I asked the head coach if my parents could, you know, come. They were coming to the game. Could they ride on the bus to the stadium? Because that's really in college football. That bus ride is really an amazing thing because you get a police escort. You know, they stop the traffic on the streets. And when you go into Baton Rouge, you, you got to kind of wind around on these really narrow streets to get back to the stadium. And the fans have been drinking since Thursday. So they are greased up and they're beating on your bus. I'm, te I'm telling you, they're beating on your bus when you stop at a, at a, like, as you come on campus, then it's really the roads get narrower and narrower. And, and it's really a slow procession through. And so they'll start rocking your bus and all this stuff. <laughs> and my mom was sitting behind me. My mom and dad were behind me. So at when when we got you go up this little rise to the stadium and you got to walk through the LSU fans to get into the stadium yeah and so my mother who was at that time probably about 65 um little sweet little lady and my dad gets off the bus and then my mother's in front of me taking the two steps down the bus and all of a sudden this drunk LSU fan and it's the woman about my mother's age 
jumps in front of my mom as she's getting off the thing and gives her the double one finger salute and says, we going to kick your ass today. <laughs> and my, my mom was absolutely mortified, but it was something. And then they had that damn tiger, you know, Mike yeah. the tiger that they have. Well, <clears throat> when you walk into the stadium, you got to walk through these really narrow tunnels to get back to the visitor's locker room. Yeah. And they put Mike right next to the visitor's locker room. And then as your players start to walk into the locker room, they start beating on his cage. And so he goes, and that thing's got a microphone in the cage anyway. So it's so loud. And I mean to tell you, our kids were like this. They were scared to death. <laughs> wow. That's, that's amazing. I mean, I was, I was going to actually get to that game a little bit later, um, but sort of, uh, what was yeah? Other than that, like, what was the rest of the experience like when you played at LSU? Oh, it's fantastic because um, you know it, it's such a part of the culture in Louisiana and LSU. And I used to recruit; that was one of my recruiting areas. And certainly, if the Tigers wanted a guy, they got him. And now Saban's done a pretty good job of trying to make inroads in Louisiana. Yeah. You know, he'll go down there and get he can compete with LSU for kids. But you know, when that program is good they basically build a fence around the state of Louisiana because the high school football in Louisiana is really, really good. Yeah. And uh, like, for example, uh, Tyran Matthew who went to St. Augustine's in, in New Orleans, uh, their defensive coordinator played for me. And so I went in there recruiting one time and, and he said, Jeff, I got a little kid that I think is a really good football player, but he's not getting recruited by the SEC because he's too small. He said, and this is spring of his junior year when you normally when you get your get offers, right? right? Yeah. So everybody'd been through and nobody really took him because he was, you know, my size, five, nine, five, ten. And so I said, okay, bring it, bring him out. And this is a Catholic school in inner city New Orleans. So a kid comes out and he's got a t-shirt, I mean a coat and tie on and the whole yeah. thing. And really nice kid, light skinned kid. And uh we're talking and I really liked the kid. So I took his film back and we turned him down because we didn't think he was big enough. Cause you could barely see him on tape. The film wasn't very good. And it was Tyran Matthew. And <laughs> as crazy as that is, it wasn't until late in the recruiting process that he actually blew up and, and started to get, you know, play. And then when as soon, as soon as the Tigers, you know, wanted him, it was, it was over, you know, and, and, uh, but, you know, it's amazing the the football, you know, the NFL keeps stat it keeps stats on everything. And Louisiana is always either one or two in terms of number of NFL players per capita, you know, in, yeah. in the state, right? Yeah. They produce outstanding football players every year. You go around, you go around the rosters of the NFL and they're just loaded with Louisiana kids. Yeah. Wow. Well, we'll sort of circle back in a little bit back to yeah, your time at Louisiana tech, but we could just uh, sort of go to the start of your coaching career and sort of transition from player to coach. So I'm correct in saying that you attended the University of Maine, where you played there for a couple of yep. years as a defensive back. Yep. Um, and then you completed your degree, was it at the University of Indiana, South Bend campus, is that correct? Yeah, and I'll I tell you what happened. I was uh, I was not the most motivated of students uh, as a, when I was playing. I went to college to play football. I didn't, you know, I, I, I was actually played two sports when I went. In my first year, I played both baseball and football. And then, you know, you get kind of torn because in in the spring, when you have spring practice, the baseball team's playing. And in the fall, the baseball team's having fall practice and the football team's playing. And it really needed to make a choice after the first year. And my dad had been in professional baseball for 30 years. And I think he was a little heartbroken when I chose football. But football had always been my biggest love. And I was lucky enough to play at a – for a great guy, a guy named Jack Picknell, who would later become the head coach of the Barcelona Dragons and, and uh, <clears throat> the Scottish Claymores. And his son, Jackie, was our head coach at Louisiana Tech when I was at Louisiana Tech. So um, I had a great experience. I was recruited by a guy named Jerry DiNardo, who, you know, big Notre Dame fans would recognize him as an All-American guard at Notre Dame, who later went on and became the head coach at LSU at Vanderbilt um, and Indiana and uh, is now doing television, Big Ten Network television stuff. So I was around really good people and really good coaches, and I had a, I had an outstanding 
college football experience. I, I, I would hope that every kid who goes play college football has the same kind of experience I had. And in the, my senior year, which was 1980, I think it was, the fall of 80, I'm walking past the head coach's office. This is about week six. And I had ruptured my bicep tendon week two. And then I just kept playing with it. And he, he, I'm walking past his office and I hear him go, Jeffrey, get in here. And listen, only two people ever call me Jeffrey. And that's my mother and Jack. And it was only when they were mad at me that, that I had done something wrong that I got referred to as Jeffrey. So I came into his office and I'm thinking to myself, what did I do? And I didn't skip any classes. I didn't, you know, I, so he go, he looks at me and he goes, what are you going to do when this is over? And I went, what? He goes, what are you going to do when this is over? And I said, what do you mean, coach? He said, Jeff, you got five more games to play in your life. And then you're going to, you know, you're not going to play professional football. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. I said, what over? I mean, thought about what happens after you're done playing and that's he said he looked at me and he said i think you should coach i think you would make a great coach and um that's how it happened i had no plan going into university to be a coach one day it just jack said that's what he thought i should do and and it's ended up working out wow <laughs> and so um how did you end up going from from South Bend, Indiana, to being a graduate assistant at Western Montana Community College? Because of great advice by Jack. Right, Jack had just we had finished that season, and Jack got the Boston College job, right. and <clears throat> he he said to me, he said, Jeff, he said, I'll take you to Boston College as a graduate assistant, but I don't think that's a good move for you because coaching is a contact business. And he said, I think you need to go out and create your own network of contacts and, and get out of the Northeast, get, get to another part of the country where you can, because in this business, your contact base is how you continue to stay employed and get new jobs and all that stuff. So it was great advice. I wrote 75 handwritten letters to every school I could think of and looking for a graduate assistantship, got 74 no's and uh, the guy from New Mexico state wrote, I didn't write Western Mont Montana cause I'm, that's the bottom of the food chain. I mean, that is, is that's low level college football for your, it's still college football, but it's low level college football. So I wrote to the guy at New Mexico state. He wrote me back and he said, Jeff, I don't have anything, but my offensive coordinator just took the job at Western Montana and he might. So I got a hold of this guy, Don Christensen, uh, we talked and then he called me back about three days later. He goes, you know, I'm going to give the GA job to a quarterback who had played here. And it was a high school, a high school teacher and coach in the state of Montana. And I was devastated because that was, that was my only, I was my only hope. I was my last, my last straw and Jack had moved on and he'd hired all of his graduate assistants. And so there was no, it was like July and I didn't have a, didn't have a job. I just graduated. You know, my parents wanted me out of the house and making, you know, making a living. And so I actually started the process to go to the Peace Corps. Right. And, and then the guy called me back like three weeks later and, you know, the, the guy he had offered the job to had taken it, but then his wife got pregnant. He said, I can't live on graduate graduate assistant money with the family so he went back to his teaching job right. and that's that's i mean it's just sheer good luck right yeah. that's i can't yeah. say that you know it's funny everybody asked me about you know my career and they, they talk about why did you do this and how'd you go there and what how did i said hey 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 hey, hey. Mao Tse Tung had a five-year plan i didn't i didn't know what i was doing five days from right now so <laughs> it just kind of all fell in place <laughs> wow and um it's interesting because it sort of seems like just going over your career that Montana is a place that you kept sort of coming back to, certainly in the er early period of it with, with various coaching jobs. Is there any sort of, is there any particular reason for that? Or is, as you say, is it just kind of a luck thing? No, I think it would happen. You know, I went to Western and then uh, had the, had a great first year experience. And then um, because of my connections uh, at Maine, 
and Coach McMillan that Dartmouth had a job that was open, and uh, that was obviously a g- giant step up. Yes. So I took that job. I was there one season, and then the University of Montana uh, contacted me about going back to Montana, and you know that was Big Sky Conference. It was you know it better football. It was an opportunity to get you know to to expand and and again grow. And so, you know, as a, as a young coach, if you're in this business, you got to keep moving when you're early, particularly early in your career, because it's all about, you know, building that contact base, getting more experience, doing new things, chat, more challenges, all of it. So I went from Montana. I was there for three years. Um, I went to Pennsylvania. I was there for f- three or four. I mean, I went, became a head coach at Rocky Mountain. And then I went to University of New Mexico because a friend of mine had gotten a defense coordinator job in New Mexico, was there one year, then came up to professional football. So it was a real fast ride because in less than 10 years, I'd gone from a college football player to coaching in pro football. Yeah. Yeah. And and how did you, you land that head coaching job at uh, Rocky Mountain College? I think probably because nobody else wanted it. Right. I mean, <laughs> it was it was a bad job. I mean, there were only 800 students at the university, um, their, their college. There were only 800 students. I think we didn't have enough football players in spring practice to have a scrimmage at the end of spring practice. So we had to play the play an alumni team. You know, we invited the alumni to come back and play. So they, you know, they roll a beer keg to the sideline, and they're a bunch of fat guys, and and uh, you know, we're out there. But what's amazing about that, that is that Dick Vermeil, who I'd met when I was in Philadelphia, has been the, probably the biggest coaching influence on my career. He came out and actually worked, coached with us for a week with all these kids from, you know, Weibo, Montana and Plentywood, Montana, all these little tiny, tiny towns. And here's the guy that took the Philadelphia Eagles to the Super Bowl and all this stuff, coaching with them. And at the end of the alumni game, we beat the alumni and they hadn't won a game. Rocky Mountain hadn't won a game, I think, in two years. And we beat the alumni in the spring. So it was the first time these kids had ever had success. And we go in the locker room after the game and the kids give Coach Vermeil the game ball. And I mean, Coach Vermeil is Coach Vermeil. He's going to be emotional. And he got tears in his eyes and all yeah. stuff. I later went and visited him when he took the Rams job and came back into coaching. And he still had that football in his office. That, wow. that was such an amazing experience. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, so sort of, what was the reason, just quickly on, on, on Rocky Mountain College, what was the reason then that you decided to move on from there? Well, because, you know, again, relationships are so important in this business. Yeah. And we, we, you know, we had gone, I think we went five and five, which is the first yeah. non-losing season that they'd had forever. You know, we had we and we had a lot of fun and we really changed a lot of things about the program. And, you know, we had a great president who wanted football to succeed. And, you know, we were going on a real upward trajectory. But a guy named Greg Newhouse, who is, again, was really instrumental in my early career and a really, really good coach, had left Hawaii and taken the defensive coordinator job at New Mexico. And he called me and he asked me to come down and coach the outside linebacker. So I went, you know, I thought about it and, you know, I just said, you know, I can be a head coach again. You know, when you're young, you think this way, I'll, yeah. I'll be a head coach again some other day. But right now this is too great an opportunity to work with Greg and, you know, coaching at that time, it was the Western athletic conference. So it was big schools. I'm talking about New Mexico, BYU, Utah. I mean, some really good football programs. Yeah. And I wanted to compete at that level. Um, and so we, I made that jump. And then from there, after one season, Greg, the, the BC Lions and the CFL tried to get Greg to come up as the defensive coordinator. And during the negotiations, the head coach said, you know, I'm looking for a young guy to coach special teams for me. And Greg mentioned me and the guy called me and he asked me to have our coach special teams. And I said, yes, which was a bold faced lie. <laughs> I never goes that down a special thing. <laughs> so, you know, as soon as we got off the phone, I called Coach Vermeil, who was the first special teams coach in the history of the NFL right. for George Allen. And and I said to Coach, I said, Coach, I just told a guy I can coach special teams. Can you help me? And so he he turned me on to Lynn Stiles, who had been his special teams guy, who was in San Francisco with the Niners at the time. 
and I was able to fake my way through it and <laughs> got the job and was again, Alex, it's, I mean, like, like I'm telling you, so dumb luck. The guy who's my punter and kicker is a guy named Louis Pasaglia, who's in the CFL hall of fame. So I, I went in there as this young guy and Louis was older than me. Right. And I'm coaching this legend who's older than me. And he liked me for some reason. And he really helped me learn the game and learn, you know, basically he helped me become a professional football coach. That's amazing that you can learn it from a player, but that was just, that, that was the situation. Wow. <laughs> um, so sort of moving forward a little bit in your career then, you'd, you'd, mm -hmm. you'd worked in, in professional football. Uh, so after the 2003 NFL Europe season finished, what was then the reason behind going back to coaching college football and how did you end up sort of going from Amsterdam to Ruston, Louisiana and working well, with Louisiana Tech? It, 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 it all goes around and, and yeah. comes around, right? Jack was the head coach at uh, Barcelona, I think, or Scotland, I can't remember at that point. And um, we were in training camp in Florida and all the teams were in the same, you know, we're in the same city, we're in Tampa and we're doing training camp. And I get a call from Jack and um, he said, I need you to help me. And I said, coach anything, right? Cause I mean, this is my guy, right? And he's the guy that started me in the business. And Jackie was, his son was the head coach at Louisiana tech and he'd lost a couple of coaches. Um, and he was starting to get into the time in his career where it was really critical. You know, it was a really critical time. And Jack said, would you go help Jackie for one year and I'll talk to the NFL Europe and we'll, we'll keep your job for you. You'll have a job. You can come back, you know? Right. And I said, absolutely. I'll go do it. And because I mean, that was Jack and, and if Jack, I, you know, that's just the way it is, you know, the yeah. loyalty thing. So I went there, had a great experience. Um, you know, we opened with the University of Miami. And I'm telling you, this was the U. I mean, this is yeah. back in the days of the U, right? And, and uh, you know, Sean Taylor's playing safety. And, and I think Port Clinton Portis was the running back. And right. Kellen Winslow Jr. was the tight end. And, I mean, they were loaded. Uh, Jonathan Vilma was the line. I mean, they were loaded, bro. Yeah. I mean, loaded. And I had learned the run and shoot uh, earlier in my career. And so one, I was coaching tight ends and special teams at Louisiana Tech. And one of the things we did was run some run and shoot stuff against, against Miami and um, had some success. And we had a quarterback, um, Luke McCown, who is of that McCown family. Yes. That, yeah. All right. And he was, we had a good player and he, he you know, but we couldn't score with them. But I will tell you this story. We're late in the game. Josh Kobe's our kicker. And Josh would go on and have a great career in the NFL at Jacksonville. And he, we find, we score late in the game and we go out to kick off. And Scobe says to me, he goes, I'm going to put this one in the bleachers. And it, we played at the Independent Bowl, Independence Bowl. And in the end zone, there's a, the bleachers right off the end zone, right? And so he goes out and he whacks it. And I mean, he hits it, but he hits it flat and low and i mean it wasn't it wasn't i don't think the ball got over four feet off the ground the whole way so it's like a bullet going back there and miami had put in a freshman kid to return and he the ball almost goes through his chest it's hit so hard but he catches it and that that ball came back as fast as it went down there and it was devin it was devin hester's first return as a college player wow and and, and <laughs> Scobie knocked him. Scoby knocked him out of bounds at the fifty. But I'm, I'm telling you, I was like, "Hope oh, whoever that kid is, he's going to have a great career." <laughs> Only one of the greatest returners of all time. Yep. <laughs> um, was it? Uh, was it in a, a sense maybe a bit of a maybe culture shock isn't the right word, but was it a bit weird? in some respects, sort of going back to the college level, you know, after 13 years of, of actually doing professional football at all? Well, you know what? I, the ways, ways things have run. And I think, I think there's a difference in the two, certainly that, you know, college football is a great institution and 
nobody's ever graduated from the Chicago Bears or the Philadelphia Eagles or, you know, the Miami Dolphins or the Hamilton Tiger Cats. That's pro football. Pro football is a business. College football is a big business too, but it's a, it's a unique thing. It's your, you take a kid when he's 18 and they usually leave when they're 22. It's when they, they're away from home for the first time in their lives. A lot of, it's, it's such a, it's such an incredible time in a young player's life. And then the traditions and all of that stuff. I really love college football. But um, the approach in terms of how you coached or worked with the players, it's all the same. It's all the same. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I would I would take the same approach if I was, you know, coaching, you know, I don't know, the London Warriors or the Birmingham Lions or, you know, anywhere. It just, you know, you, it, to me, coaching is about finding ways to help players play at their highest level, whatever that is, whether it's an, you know, professional player who makes his living this way, or whether it's a a kid playing junior football for the first time, it's still the same thing. Sure. Yeah. How was it um, recruiting in the state of Louisiana and sort of having to compete with LSU, um, other Louisiana based universities and and colleges in the South for, for high school prospects? Well, you know, I loved recruiting. I absolutely loved it because to me it was it was just interaction, right? The best recruiters, in my opinion, the best recruiters are the best listeners, not the best talkers, not yeah. the best salesmen. They're the best listeners because with every player that you recruit, he will tell you or his significant other, when I say significant, significant other, I'm talking about there's always a decision maker in the thing, maybe his mother, maybe his dad, maybe his girlfriend, maybe his coach, whoever, but yeah. they will tell you what's important to the kid and what will make the kid decide to come. I recruited Michael Bennett, who later went on, and had a tremendous career from, uh, he wasn't Louisiana kid. He was, his family had migrated from Louisiana to Houston after the hurricane. But, um, Michael, uh, and his brother Martellus were phenomenal high school players. And I recruited Michael. He signed at Louisiana Tech. And um, people were like, how in the heck did you get that kid to come to Louisiana Tech? Well, I learned from Michael's girlfriend, who's now his wife, Pele, what was important in Mike's life. What were the things that, that he wanted out of a college experience? And so, you know, that's to me, I, I love that competition i love going up against the big schools like there was a kid joey fontana that tragically uh never played college football he he redshirted at smu he was from a catholic school in new orleans was recruited by stanford nebraska all the big joints right and he came to he came to smu redshirted his first year we're getting ready to play a bowl game he's in a in a bowl practice and gets maybe one of the worst knee injuries I've ever seen and never played a down in college football. But still, what a great kid and what a great opportunity to meet a family. And, and again, during the course of that recruiting, it was his mom and dad that were the significant others. And they were the one. So you recruit the kid, but you also recruit the significant other. Because I learned this from uh, – it's a great – if you're if – you're, going to be a recruiter one of the things about it is you want to win that person right so if it's the mom you want to win the mom because you're only allowed to see him once every week right yeah but she sees him every single day and so if she likes you then you got a way better chance than if you know some guy just comes in and gives a spiel and walks out the door and so, like I say, I love the recruiting process. I, I love the competition of it. I love the meeting the people of it. Uh, you know, it's a really, really crazy experience. I, I could tell you story after story about. <laughs> I, 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 one was I'm recruiting in Lutcher, Louisiana, and there were, that's where Jarvis Landry was going to school. Well, Jarvis was really a. I mean, like one of the top recruits in the country. And Bebe was an assistant at USC at that time. And this was a, the day I went into the school was a day that you couldn't, you could go to the school, but you couldn't contact the players. Right. And, and so I walk up to the football office at Lutcher and I see this great big black Escalade with smoked out windows 
sitting outside out front of the thing and i look in the front window and who's in the who's sitting in the driver's seat it's Bebe. who's in the passenger seat jarvis landry <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said I, I went like this to him and, and so he got a big smile on his face because he knew i wouldn't rat him out but yeah. yeah that's just you know it's kind of funny stuff that goes on <laughs> um we, we we talked just a little bit about that that game uh at death valley in 2003 um just quickly sort of what was it what was it like to go up against Saban uh, in that game I mean that oh, was, LSU team was, went on to to win a national championship yeah that was it was awesome Mock was the quarterback and Mock was like really a game manager he was a good quarterback he wasn't going to be an NFL player but they had Andrew Whitworth was playing left tackle for him at that time and I mean they were loaded they had tons of guys I mean I remember you, you you're out there warming up and we're down on one end and you look down the end, down towards the other there's a tunnel where they come out of and all of a sudden and you can't it's really narrow and all of a sudden you see the yellow helmets in the tunnel yeah and then the then the buzz starts in the stadium and then they come on the field and i remember and like i said this is a team we had played miami we had beaten michigan state right i mean we played we had a good football team we yeah. weren't like just gonna roll over but I remember seeing them come out of that tunnel and I went, <laughs> I went to one of my players. I said, turn around, don't look down there. <laughs> they, were, they were a pretty intimidating bunch, man. And, and um, we hung with them for a while, but it was, it was really interesting to see how, and I understand how Saban wins like he does. They were extremely disciplined, fundamentally sound, played extremely hard, um, you know, all the things that you see his Alabama teams do now, yeah. they, they did, you know, yeah. and you know, his coaches, you know, he had outstanding coaches on his coaching staff. Uh, Vince, Vince Dooley's son uh, was the special teams coach at, at uh, LSU at that time. And then he went to Miami with, with uh, Nick and then eventually got the Louisiana tech job, then a the Tennessee job. So, yeah. you know, he, he was constantly putting out, like just like he is today putting out yeah. great coaches and guys that got yeah. you know like you just saw sark got the texas job and his his assistants are all over the place yeah yeah no i think it's quite crazy when you you look at that i think that 2003 team i think will muschamp was maybe the defensive coordinator yeah you know, he obviously went on to have a um well, i mean he was fired last year or whatever but um yeah you had uh, i think jimbo fish might be in the offensive coordinator as well so it was it was a bunch they yeah. had a great he, and he's always surrounded himself with great coaches because yeah. even though he's quote a hard guy to work for you know that if you if you go to work for him he's going to help you in your career path and the number of guys that have been saving assistants that then went on he's very much like his friend bill belichick they're yeah. very close in in the nfl you, if you if you can do the work there. And if you ex excel with him, then you're going to get a head coaching opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So sort of transitioning then to your time at Hawaii, what was the reason behind deciding to go and coach the Rainbow Warriors? Well, um, a couple of things. Hawaii had always been home to me, right? It's uh, as, a, as a kid growing up from dugout to dugout from Coos Bay, Oregon to Bradenton, Florida, I, I never really felt at home any place until I went to Hawaii. And I just realized that that it sounds, you know, I don't sound like a knucklehead, but it sounded, it was just like, I, I remember getting off the plane. And the first time I went there, I said, this is it. This is home. It will always be home. And that was way before I coached there, but I'd always been a Hawaii fan. And as a high school kid, I wanted to go play there. And Dick Tomey was the head coach at the time. And, and he, he's, uh, called me and he said, Jeff, we don't recruit off the West coast. It's just too far. And, and our success rate with players it, from far away is not real good. So, and then, so that was the end of that, but I always kind of followed them. I had a lot of Hawaii kids in the pros. And then I'm, I met June Jones during, um, during uh, his time as the head coach at Atlanta, uh, our, our training camp in, in 93, I think it was and NFL Europe was in the Falcons facility. So I got to know him and Rod Rust and a number of his coaches really liked June. Um, then guys that two guys that I just really respected in the business, Mouse Davis, who's the father of the run and shoot and had been June's 
a college coach and coordinator in the NFL. And Jerry Glanville joined June's staff at Hawaii. So I was working for the NFL in London, called June about a kid, a uh, Czechoslovakian kid he had. Through that conversation, you know, we talked. And I said, June, I want to come work at, you know, Jerry's there, Mouse is there. It's, I, I, I got to be a part of this, right? He said, I don't have any jobs. I said, I don't care. Just, you know, I'll go back and be a graduate assistant. And he said, come on, stop it. And then, then we hung up the phone. And then two days later, he called me back. He goes, were you really serious? And I said, yeah, well, I'm serious. I said, I, I don't, you know, there, there's moments in your life where you just have to go, right? Yeah. It's just something you have to do. And I remember going in to talk to Tony Allen, who was my supervisor in the NFL. I said, Tony, I'm going to leave. I'm going to take a job at Hawaii. And he knew that's where I wanted to go. And, you know, he was happy for me. He goes, what are you going to, what, what, what are you going to coach? I said, I don't know. I'm going to be a GA. And he said, what? And so I went, I went from a six figure job in the NFL to making 800 bucks a month as a graduate assistant at Hawaii and didn't even have a, didn't even have a position when I went there. It just, June said, don't, you know, June's kind of, June's kind of different. He just says, we'll, we'll, we'll fit you in somewhere. Right. <laughs> so I went and I hit it off right away with Jerry Glanville. And then Jerry said, I want that guy as my D line coach. And, and then, after the first season, Jerry went into June and said, June, if you don't hire him, I'm leaving. If you don't give him a full-time job, I'm leaving. So June, <laughs> you know, moved, moved a guy and made me full-time and then the rest of this history. Wow. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was a brave decision to go and do that, but certainly paid off. <laughs> well, I think, you know, what happens, Alex, and I, I've tried to live this way, is, you know, it's that old saying that, you know, you only regret the things you don't do, yeah. you know? And, and so I would hate to think that I'm now at, at this point in my life and had never had that experience because it was phenomenal, you know, yeah. to, to go and be a part Hawaii is such a special place. Right. And then to turn that program and, and be 12 and oh, and go to the sugar bowl and play Georgia and be, be a BCS buster and, all the thing, all the great kids we were able to recruit there, and uh, it just was a phenomenal experience. And it's one of the reasons why now I live in Hawaii, you know, permanently. Yeah. Wow. Um, so yeah, just just talking about that that second season uh, at Hawaii, um, and the team went to the Sugar Bowl. So what what was it? What was it like playing in the Sugar Bowl and sort of just that whole season? How it all kind of played out. Well, it was actually the third season third because season. the second, yeah, the second season we won eleven games. Uh, we went, up, we beat uh, Arizona State in the bowl game. Uh, so we had a good football. I think the, to be honest with you, I think the the two thousand and six team was better than the two thousand and seven undefeated team. Oh, okay. uh, we had beaten Purdue. Um, we lost to Boise, who was ranked in the top twenty, and we lost to Oregon State. And I'm trying to think who else. Oh, we lost to Alabama in the opener. We played Alabama in Tuscaloosa in the opener. And, you know, we're, th we're on the like 10 yard line trying to punch one in at the end to win the game. Right. And that's when I knew we were going to be a good team because we didn't, we went into that environment, you know, and you know, Bryant Denny stadium and the whole deal. And our kids didn't back off, a, not, not an inch. And so we got on a roll beat Purdue uh, at the end of the season. We lost Air, lost to Oregon State that knocked us out of a big bowl game, but we went and played Arizona State out of the Pac-12 and just shellacked them. I mean, we beat them like a drum. Yeah. And uh, then Colt made the decision to come back for the next year, and I knew we were going to be a good team. But we got on a roll and ended up being 12-0 and and go to the Sugar Bowl. And – you know, that's there's a lot of stuff that went on in that time because June was leaving and, you know, right. Colt, Colt had some issues that he was dealing with. And uh, it was kind of anticlimactic, really, the game. Right. Uh, Ma Matthew Stafford was there. And, and uh, uh, I just remember warming up, you know, we're on the field warming up and he's throwing, you know, what we call pat and go. And I'm standing at the 50 and he's about probably maybe. 10 yards away from me and he's throwing and he's throwing the ball and you could hear the ball go through the air. You could hear, you could hear it whistle through the air. And I thought to myself, this, you know, cause Colt had a, had a good arm and he was really accurate. 
But I mean, Stafford had a, it was like, nah, that's a different dude over there. <laughs> um, just talking about Colt, sort of, uh, what was he like as, as a leader during his time at Hawaii? And sort of, what do you think he represents for the program even now? I, th- I think his, his, he, 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 next to Duke Kahanamoku, who was a, you know, I think a six time Olympic champion swimmer and what they call the ambassador of Aloha. He, Colt Brennan was probably the greatest sports icon in the history of Hawaii sports. And I'm talking any sport, you know, the, the great surfers that they've had, Duke, you know, they've t- churned out pre- professional football players, baseball players. But Colt resonated with everybody. He was a, a white kid who came to Hawaii, and that's sometimes a tough transition. But he embraced the culture. The culture embraced him. He always had time for everybody. I mean, I remember one time in, in, after the after we beat Washington to go undefeated, they had an autograph session, and there must have been five thousand people lined up for his autograph. And he he stayed he stayed there and signed every single one and took pictures with kids and all of it. He was wonderful that way, and his teammates loved him. He we had a, a offensive line that was all of Samoan heritage, right? And he took Samoan class. Yeah, you know, and and so he's got this offensive line that's you know Larry Salfea and and uh, Hercules Satele and all these Samoan heritage kids, whether they were Samoan or first generation in Hawaii, they all spoke Samoan, and so Colt took. Samoan class at the University of Hawaii so that he could communicate with his offensive linemen during the game. And so all of our protection checks and, you know, what, what, uh, you know, he, he, he'd say on Lua and Lua is two, right? Yeah. So unless you had Polynesian players on the other side of the field, you have no idea what he's talking about, right? So that was just another way that he kind of endeared himself to his teammates. And as big a superstar as he was, and I think he's he's he was as big as superstars you could have in college football. And you know, Hawaii being Hawaii, where it's a very small place, and there was no place he could hide, and no place where he could have a bad day or a bad you know a bad experience or temper tantrum or you know. And he never, never that I ever saw had a interaction with another with another human being on on that island or when we went to the mainland where he wasn't really 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 a first class guy and so i think there's such so much of polynesian culture is based upon family and it's based upon uh being humble and that was cold and you know he was he was playful i mean he had a great smile and a laugh and he loved to have fun and um, you know, he could be self-deprecating. He could laugh at himself. You know, he, he, any, you know, he'd do crazy things like he loved Bob Marley. So one, one year he, uh, I think it was his junior year, he twisted up his hair and had, you know, little, little white dreadlocks, you know, and then the next year, uh, he dyed his hair blonde and cut the side out and dyed the Hawaiian islands into the side of his head. Uh, There's pictures of that floating around. You can see, um, and it was really tragic loss because somehow in that time, um, he kind of lost his way a little bit in in terms of, you know, um, the drug thing. And, uh, I, I don't know if it was because he was hurt. I remember when he was, uh, he was a senior. He hurt his ankle at UNLV. Actually, we're playing. We're going to play UNLV, <clears throat> and we're at <clears throat> we're at the stadium at UNLV the day before the game. And he's out, you know, playing touch football on a, you know in, in pre <clears throat> in pre practice, and and he hurt his ankle real bad. And I think that might have been the start of him starting to use and that. Um, you know, it just it just disintegrated from there, and and uh, you know his life was really once once he uh, got in an automobile accident, 
<coughs> while he was playing for the Redskins, which really he nearly died. And he had serious brain injury. And uh, I, mean, I think he just kind of, the rest of it just kind of spiraled, spiraled out of control. And it was really a tragic loss because he was really a special kid. Yeah. No, that's, um, yeah. It's a terrible shame. Um, yeah. You've, we talked earlier sort of about recruiting. Um, sort of regarding that, uh, how hard is it to recruit at Hawaii sort of from a, uh, from a logistical perspective? Um, sort of, could you maybe talk a bit about that? Well, there were two things about that that, you know, I, I think every, every place has its challenges and every place has its, you know, benefits or, or uh, things that are positives, right? Uh, I, I've never been at, a Michigan or a USC or an Alabama or a Georgia or any of those places where, you know, Texas, where it's different. I've always been at a place where, you know, we had restrictions and limitations, you know, whether it's, you know, the academic you know, restrictions at an Ivy League school or uh, the fact that, you know, in New Mexico, for example, there were, there's so very few football players in the state. You had to go everywhere to find them. Right. Um, SMU, where, you know, the death penalty still 20 years later loomed over that program. And, uh, you know, you were, you were in the state of Texas where you were probably in, you were probably on the list of priorities for a Texas kid somewhere around eighth. And um, at Hawaii, the biggest limitations that we faced were number one, budgetary. Uh, if I told you how much our recruiting budget was, you would not believe it because our recruiting budget was less than a school like LSU spends on mailing out letters to kids and, and you know, uh, you know, social media stuff around the country. Yeah. I mean, it was it was ridiculously low. Um, so we couldn't go out a lot. There were, as a matter of fact, uh, the two years, the last two years I was at UH, myself, I went out uh, off campus to recruit uh, George Lumpkin. Uh, one of our defensive coaches went to LA during Christmas to recruit, but that was because he could stay with his mom and dad. And uh, Rich Miano, uh, one of our defensive coaches went off, off island one time. And so, you know, usually you have eight or nine guys on the road. Well, we couldn't do that because we couldn't afford it. You know, with it's a five hour flight just to get to LA. And then you've got the cost of hotels and rent cars and all the stuff. And so, you know, we had to find kids that, you know, you, you have to work a little harder because you have to find a kid that, number one, doesn't want to just come on the visit because he wants to go, you know, to Hawaii for the weekend, you yeah. know, and lay on the beach and, you know, see, you know, see how beautiful the islands are. You had to find a kid that you was really genuinely interested. We tried to find kids who had some kind of connection to the island. It's really interesting that the, the, the the die was cast or the, 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 I guess the strategy was hatched during the day of days of Dick Tony at, at, when he was the head coach at Hawaii, because he, he would only recruit the West coast. Uh, and he would only recruit kids who had some sort of tie to the islands, or he recruited military kids because they're used to being all over the place. Sure. Or he recruited kids that didn't have, anything to go back to. So he may be, you may be a kid from, uh, you know, I'll just use a, use an example. You may be a Houston kid who lives in the really, really bad part of Houston. You know, there's nothing, you know, I mean, it's just a bad situation. He would take a chance on those kind of kids because there was nothing at home that lured them back other than, you know, the street. And so, you kind of had to find those kind of guys. So you looked at, like when I looked at, when you look at the kids that I recruited there, they were all kind of guys with stories. They were Gerard Lewis and uh, Myron Newberry were two junior college kids from the state of Texas that were both five, nine. And, you know, there weren't a lot of people that wanted five, nine corners. Now they're great players and they came in and started very every game for us at UH. Uh, Ryan Mouton was a all American defensive back from Blinn junior college, but had a, had a bad academic profile and had a, you know, had, I had known him 
when he was a high school senior, I had recruited him when I was at Louisiana Tech. So even though he had committed to the University of Utah, I still recruited him because I felt like if we could get him to come to, if, he, if I could get him to come to the island, that he would be a guy that <clears throat> would, you know, would, we could turn, what well, we use the term turn, we could get him to decommit at Utah and come to us. And he did, and he was drafted in the third round and played about eight years for the, for, uh, uh, for the Titans and, and the Redskins. And then uh, we had a kid named Jake Patek. And I'll, this is a true story. I mean, Jake was a guy who went to junior college at Blinn, the same junior college that Mouton went to. And he was a white safety from a little town in South Texas. And, you know, he, he was a guy that I just, he's one, I just had a feel about him. I, you know, I just really said, this kid's a great football player, but he's a white defensive back. He's, there's nothing special about him. He didn't, you know, he wasn't six, three, he was six feet tall. He was 200 pounds. He wasn't, you know, he didn't run, you know, he ran good, but he didn't run great, but he, he put the tape on and he, he was like a tackling machine. He was always in the right place. He's really smart. He wanted to be a division one football player in the worst possible way. And so I just fell in love with the kid when I was recruiting him. And uh, he sent me a film, a junior of his junior college film. And I took it into the recruiting meeting and there's all of our coaches are sitting around the desk and we put it on. I didn't tell him who it was. Right. And I just let, ran the film and, and, you know, guys started to say things like, nah, you know, just, you know, I don't, I don't see him making plays on the ball. Uh, you know, I don't know what kind of range he's got, all this kind of stuff. And I just wrote down all the, all the negative comments. And then I went back to him and I said, all right, Jake, here's what we got to do. Show him, get me a highlight tape where you make plays on the football, where you show range, where you show great hustle, you know, all the, right. And so he did send it back to me. And this was like a month later. He sent it back to me and I took it into the recruiting room again. I said, this is Jake Patek from Blinn Junior College, right? And I put the same guy on tape, right? And everybody around the room said, offering. And we offered him and he came and was a two-year starter and a great player. And that's the, you have, but you had to find, you had to really work to find guys like that. Ray Hisataki was a big offensive lineman that was playing junior college, was a defensive lineman in junior college, but I really thought Ray had a chance to be a great offensive lineman. It was a real, we're battling San Jose state, which is right down the road from where he grew up. And he really is a family kid, but he's a Polynesian kid. He had a, he had a cousin who lived in Honolulu. So we got him away from San Jose state and San Diego state and a number of those schools in California. And he came, made the transition was a two year starter as an offensive lineman played in the, played in the pros. Francis Maka was a, uh, defensive end who uh, his family was actually <clears throat> uh, Tongan royalty and he had family in the island but you had to find those kinds of kids because they could they would come on a visit and they, their families would shower them with love and you know give them time to spend with their families on the, in Honolulu and then there was a connection um, uh, we had a kid <clears throat> Josh Leonard was a junior college All-American and was really highly recruited um, out of Sacramento. Well, his dad was my high school or was my college roommate. And so we were able to go in and get him because his dad just told him, he said, you're going to Hawaii, right? And there was, you know, shoots, I can't remember how many Mountain West and Pac-12 schools wanted that kid. So you, you just had to find guys that had where there was some sort of, you know, connection probably the only one that was we uh we recruited a kid i recruited a kid named eric robinson from uh he was he led the nation in junior college in tackles and he was out of texas junior college and he really had no hawaii connection but he came up in a really bad part of dallas and was one of those kids that just wanted to get the hell out of texas right? yeah. get away from the street where he, you know and all that stuff and he came over and played really well for us and, you know, married a Hawaiian girl and he's living, living in Hawaii to this day. Hmm. Wow. Wow. So, so yeah, on the same sort of topic, did you, um, 
when you were at Hawaii, did you sort of try and sell Hawaii itself to sort of the out of state high school prospects, sort of the lifestyle as well, culture, you know, things to do outside yeah. of football, you know, instead of just it being, I mean, we see a lot of these colleges, but they're, a lot of them are just sort of in, the, in these nameless college towns where there isn't a whole lot, right? Well, I think that, you know, like, like I say, you know, the, our facilities at that time were so bad. And, and, I, and I'm telling you, they were so bad. This, this is a true story. Like, I was the D-line coach. And I walked into the defensive line meeting room in our facility on campus, and there was mold in almost an inch thick on three-quarters of the walls because they had had a typhoon. Right? They'd, had a, they'd had a tropical storm the year before, and the roof gave in on the facility, and so all of the all of the meeting rooms, or a lot of the meeting rooms, got just got inundated with water. Well, because it's so humid, they have a mold problem in Hawaii anyway, right? So there was I I, I swear to God, I took a scrape, a paint scraper, you know, like those big metal yeah. paint scrapers, and, and and my wife and I went into the meeting room and scraped the mold off the walls, and then repainted it ourselves, because we didn't have money in our budget. To hire some to hire the on-campus guys because you had to hire because the union situation had to hire the on-campus guys to come in and paint so that room had sat there for for a year with this mold on the walls so we said i my wife and i just said we ain't, we ain't putting our kids through that or you know that's not even healthy breathe that air so we went scraped it all down washed it down dried it and then painted it and then i got a girl who worked a young student who worked in uh, in in the athletic department she really was special and she came up with a way to paint all this big mural she made a big, huge mural around the room and it was all of the great defensive linemen that had played at hawaii going all the way back to larry cole who played for the cowboys and the noga brothers and all of the great i mean because white has a maatana vasa they got a ton of guys that played in the nfl that were defensive linemen and so it was like a tribute room to the, but our facilities were so bad. We would not, and I'm telling you this true, we would not take our kids around the facility when they came on their visit. They'd go to the hotel, which was right on the beach at Waikiki. They'd go out that night with our players. We'd take them to a luau, da, da, da. They'd have academic meetings the next day up campus, not in lower campus where our facilities were. We, you know, you could see our facility down there and it looks impressive because it's a big basketball arena, right? And then, <clears throat> but but the offices, the meeting rooms, the locker room, we never, never, ever let them in there, right? Then they go out the next night with their, with their host in, around town, which was fantastic. And, uh, and then we take them out to Aloha Stadium, which is 30 miles off campus on their way to the airport to leave. And, and so they would see the, you know, they walk around that stadium. That stadium's pretty impressive. It hold, held 60,000 people and it's where the Pro Bowl was held. And, you, you know, we talked to them about all the great players that have played on that turf and yada, yada, yada. And then they were gone. And so we kind of masked over the fact that we had no, we had so little money. Uh, and and they, uh, these are true stories. We had so little money that Normally, when you bring your players back for summer camp, for training camp, you you know you you put them in the dorms, but you have to pay for the dorms, right? You have to pay the the on campus housing people for the use of those dorms. We didn't have enough money, so above our locker room was a was a gigantic dance studio, right? That the dance people used. And they let us, because they weren't in school at that time, they let us bring in bunk beds, like from, I don't know, some army surplus place. And we put all of our players in this one gigantic room. And they all they all slept in the same room. It was like, it was like a scene from some crazy prison movie or something. And, <laughs> and, and but, but it was amazing because how it bound those players together, Yeah. right? I mean, because they were all sleeping in the same room. You imagine that 110 football players in the same room, sleeping in bunk beds. So there's 50, 50 some bunk beds around this room. And you know what the freaking guys figured out how to do? In the middle, all of a sudden, 
start hearing about the fact that they're having pillow fights at night, right? <laughs> and so, so me and another guy, you know, s- stay up late and we peek in the door and what they had done was they dis they disassembled the the uh, bunk beds and they made an octagon like they have at UCF yeah. out of them and it was it was like four beds stacked up in, in a five in an octagon octagon shape and then they would take the freshmen and give them pillows and throw them in there and they'd have pillow fights like and they would like bet on who was going to win and I mean it's like, it's like the craziest thing in the world but it was the kind of stuff that binds people yeah. together you know and so as a rookie or as a freshman or a new kid you had to kind of earn your you had to kind of earn your respect yeah and and once you got your respect then you were part of the you know you it's a little bit like being in a gang i guess i mean you know it's the way it was but you had this rite of passage right yeah and um it was just an amazing amazing thing yeah wow <laughs> uh, um <laughs> what w- sorry was the um was the travel quite exhausting then when you guys had to go on the road for a road game sort of as we talked a bit just a minute ago about logistics and things like that well, yeah we used to we used to laugh about it and and uh you know somebody asked me one of my friends called me so what's it like because we had gone from oh man i'm trying to think what year it was i think it was my first year we had played USC in the opener, and then we had to go to Michigan State for the second game. Well, Michigan State from Hawaii is about, I think it's 12 or 14 hour flight, right? So we would try and break it up. We would fly to LA, stay overnight in LA, because that's five and a half hours, stay overnight in LA, and fly the other five and a half or six hours the next day, right? But what it ends up, I, I used to, the guy, guy asked me, he said, what's it like with the travel? And I said, well, it's really not like traveling to go play a road game. It's like going on safari. I mean, because we would we would go, like, for example, in, in that conference at that time, Louisiana Tech was the, I think, the easternmost school, right? And that's in Louisiana. And so, and that's not hard. That's, that's a hard place to get to anyway. Right. So we would fly to Dallas or Houston, spend the night there, practice there the next day, and then go up. Like we would leave Hawaii. We practice in Hawaii on Wednesday. The kids would go to school and then we'd get a plane out. We get an evening flight out. So we'd fly all night. They'd get into Houston. They'd eat. We'd put them to bed, get them up that afternoon because usually we played at night in in louisiana alabama or any of the places we played we get them up that night we practice them that night at the time that we we, trying to get the body clocks used to the time change then the next day would be so it'd be wednesday thursday we'd do that friday which is the day before the game we would fly on to the or however we needed to get to the next place so for example like when we went to alabama we would leave on Wednesday, get to Houston, practice, do our meetings, all that stuff you do, and then yeah. Friday flew to uh, flew to Birmingham, stayed in Birmingham Friday night, then drove with a police escort forty five minutes up the road to Tuscaloosa, mm-hmm. and after we played the game, we drove back to Birmingham, stayed overnight because it would be one o'clock in the morning by the time you got back there. So you'd stay overnight, Saturday night. Sunday, you'd get on a plane and you'd fly all the way back to Honolulu through either Dallas or LA because there's no there's no Birmingham to, you know, Birmingham to Honolulu flights. So Birmingham. So we would get home Monday morning. Wow. Right. So it's almost I mean it was it was amazing. And then you may have to go travel again the next week. Yeah. Think about some of, think about some of the places we had to travel to, like Moscow, Idaho. Moscow, Idaho, you can't get there. I mean, they don't even have an airport. So you got to go to, you got to fly to San Jose, then fly from San Jose to Spokane. And then from Spokane, you got a bus an hour and a half 
to Moscow. Laramie, Wyoming, you got to fly to Denver, which is eight hours or 10 hours from Hawaii. Then you got to get on a bus and you got to go an hour and a half up the road to Laramie because they don't have, they don't have an airport either. They don't, they don't have an airport big enough for a big plane. Right. So, you know, it's just, it was crazy. Uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, where New Mexico state is, yeah. you had to fly to LA. Then from LA, you had to fly to El Paso. And then you had to get on a bus in El Paso and bus two hours back West again to, to get to Las Cruces. So it was, it was an adventure. And we, like I said, we were on safari every time. And it, cause the kids would miss, like, you know, you think about it, they'd miss Thursday and Friday classes. Yeah. Right. And, you know, they'd be getting, they'd be getting off the plane, you know, six 30 in the morning on Monday morning. Well, they ain't going to class on Monday after they've been flying all that time. So we would take tutors. We, they'd have to take their books. We'd have study table, you know, during on the road, you know? So it was, it was a, it was a deal now. Yeah. I bet. Jeez. And were there ever like any performances where you could just tell maybe that the team was just exhausted from traveling? I mean, I can just imagine, say you're halfway through the season, you've got injuries racking up, just how the season yeah, it was, progresses. Anyway. I tell you what, it was the, the, it was the trip to Ruston, Louisiana, because it was fly to Houston, that whole deal, fly to Houston, practice, <clears throat> then the next day, we said, there's no, Air, Ruston doesn't have an airport, so you either have to fly to Shreveport and bus for an hour or Monroe and bus for an hour. Either way, you're busing, right? And it's five hour drive from Houston to Ruston. And so June said one time, he had done it the other way where we had flown. Well, by the time you go to the Houston airport, because we didn't fly charter, right? Because we couldn't afford it. So we'd fly commercial flights. You got to go to the airport. You got to go through security. You got to check in. You got to do all that. Then you fly to Shreveport. Then you got to get off. You got to load the bus. You got to, you know, all that stuff. By the time it, it ends up being an eight hour day when you could drive for five and a half hours. So we, we bust from Ruston, I mean, from Houston to Ruston. And that was at the time when Katrina was happening. Right. And so we go to the, there's only like two reasonable size hotels in Ruston. So we go to the hotel and they've got a bunch of Katrina refugees living in the hotel. And these were people that were out of New Orleans that lost everything. I mean, and it was, it was, it was like living in a refugee camp and we're trying to get ready to play a football game the next night. Right. And so there's all these distractions and, you know, like it was crazy. So we went out and played them my first year on the road at their place. And you could tell our kids were tired and they were distracted and they weren't ready to play. And they just beat us. I mean, they drilled us. I mean, drilled us. And we were, we were a young team that was learning how to play and how to win and how to be a team. And that one was just too much for us. Yeah. Then two years later, we went back there, did the same thing. But we had matured. We knew how to be, you know, we were a team by then. You know, Colt had been there. It was his third year. The offensive line had been together. The defense had gotten better. And then we really pounded them two years later in the same situation. So, but that was the game that I thought, and the Michigan State game too, because it was just so long. And then you're going to Spartan Stadium and there's 85,000 people. And, you know, our kids never really got intimidated by that kind of stuff, but it was just the, the time change and the travel and all that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, in the interview you did with uh, Simon Carroll, you highlighted how easy it can be to sort of accidentally bump into high school prospects uh, <laughs> when you're not supposed to be in contact with them. Just quickly for the folks who, who might not have read that, um, could you possibly summarise the incident again and sort of give us an idea of how hard it can be for coaches to sort of stay within the boundary set out by the NCAA? Well, okay. I'm, I'm recruiting in Houston and I'm recruiting a kid who's also being recruited by Rice, which is an institution right in Houston. And obviously I know his family because I've been recruiting. Him. And so I go to 
the school that morning to see the kid because whenever a kid was going on a visit someplace else i wanted to be in his school that morning before he went just so he'd see your face again right yeah and you know so i see the kid and i really the kid's a great kid and i really liked him and the mom was a wonderful mom single mom the whole deal so i happened to stop at like a burger king or something to, to get something to eat before i went to my one on a home visit that night and the late the mother was there right so i walk over to her and i just explain exchange pleasantries and and uh, she tells me that she had just gotten you know she had just dropped her son off at rice for his official visit and she just wanted to get something to eat before she went home and we talked for maybe i don't know 10 minutes well he, the kid calls his mom that night and he says you know they talk and she says oh i ran into coach Reinbold today and we talked and he said to tell you that you know da, 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 how much he loves you and all that stuff and so the kid just being a kid mentions that on his on his visit to the coaches at rice you know that my mom really likes it coach Reinbold and all that stuff. and the, then the rice coaches report it to the ncaa as an illegal contact right yeah. because you're not allowed to see a student you're not allowed to see a player outside of his home or his school and you're only allowed so many contacts and you can't see a parent one day and a student the next day all this they got a billion rules right yeah. well, christ i'm just in i'm just in burger king to get somebody to eat before i go into a home visit and i happen to bump into her now what am i going to do like am i going to just say i can't talk to you right now which is what i guess the ncaa wants you to say but I'm, I mean, that's ridiculous to me. And so it got, it got reported. I got, uh, I got this letter from the, and I lost a, I think they took away like a week of spring recruiting or something from, you know, which is a mild slap on the wrist, but you know, for something that was completely, completely innocent and, you know, it, it, it's hard. It's just, you, there's so many rules and it's so, I mean, there's so much nonsense and um, it, it's really to the point where I don't even think the NCAA knows their own rules now. Yeah, I mean, the book that I'm, I am not kidding you where, uh, so you can see this, that NCAA book is that thick, right? And you get tested on it every year, but right? you can't go on the road and they have a test. It's about 50 questions long. And you better pass it. And if you don't pass it, you can't recruit. And so, you know, some schools do it different ways. Some the, the compliance person of the, in the school has to administer the test. Well, at some places, they kind of wink at you and give you the answers, or say, if you know, like if you got a problem, well, I'll help you. Other places, it's like they, it's like proctoring the you know your your graduation exam, right? The guy won't you know, looks at you, you know. Yeah. So it just comes down to what what kind of place you got, but it's just it's so ridiculous. It really is. But it's the rules, man. It's what we live with. Yep. Uh, just quick, uh, quickly on Hawaii before we move on to your time at SMU. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like when you received news that you'd been named one of the, the top recruiters in the country? Well, I think it was, you know, I think the biggest thing to me was it was validation of the fact that you could do it right you could do it and you had all the strikes against you i mean like everything against you and frankly i i love that place so much that um, to me it was more about the fact that you, you didn't have to use all the all the excuses that you had right like we're too far away it's we don't have enough budget you know you, you can find all the reasons not to but i think if you really love a place and you, know, you believe in what you're doing i mean i i i, I mean i could sell june jones all day long right because there are very few guys in this business that are as genuine or as caring or as good a football coach as he is so you want to tell me about, you know, I don't even know. So it's not, I'm trying to think some of the guy, head coaches that, that uh, you know, you want to talk to me about Pete Carroll, I'll go up against Pete Carroll. 
right? I'll put June up against Pete Carroll. And Pete Carroll's a great football coach and I have huge respect for him. I like him very much. He's a, but that's just, I, it didn't matter to me because I thought our head coach was as good as anybody. He'd been a head coach in pro football twice. He was, you know, he's a brilliant offensive mind. You want an offensive player, you want to play in a system that like, gives you a chance to, you know, <clears throat> really flourish, you know, play with, you know, with a great quarterback like Cole Brown. Well, defensively, you know, we had you know, Jerry Glanville was a defense coordinator. How many, how many Jerry Glanvilles are there in the world? One, and, and you get a chance to play for him. So it just came down to kind of a validation of all the things that we, you know, we tried to get people to understand. Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so in 2008, uh, you followed June Jones to SMU. Sort of what was the transition like going from Hawaii to Dallas and the reason why? Wow, it, uh, it was really hard. Um, I didn't want to go. Right. I didn't want to go. Um, because Hawaii was home, Hawaii is where I wanted to be. But I could see that in the transition, um, initially it was also, I mean, it just was such a crazy, crazy, because we're at the Sugar Bowl. I remember this explicitly, and it's like two days before the game, and you'd have your team picture in the Superdome in Atlanta, in the Mercedes-Benz Dome. And Mouse Davis was there to watch the game. And uh, he's on the field while we're having our team picture taken. And then afterwards, we had like a, I had a picture with all the kids I'd recruited and we had our defensive line picture and all this stuff. And in between some, some of those pictures, I walked over to Mouse to say hello because I love Mouse. He's a wonderful person. And he said, well, are you gonna go? And I said, go where? He said, to SMU. I said, what are you talking about? He said, your boss is going to take the SMU job. And I said, no way. That was the first I'd heard of it. This was like two days before the game. Yeah. And then June called a meeting for that night, and um, which he never does. And it was in the hospitality suite that they gave us at the hotel in New Orleans. And, you know, as coaches, we're all sitting around the hotel, that, that, lot, that suite, and nobody knows what's going on, or at least nobody professed to know what was going on and then june canceled the meeting after about we waited for about an hour for him and he didn't show up so he canceled the meeting and then this all of a sudden this current start you know this like sub current and this really i think hurt us in the game too because the players knew the players knew something was up right right and then we played the game and got pasted by georgia and got on the plane and flew back and as we started to descend into Honolulu, word started to filter back on the plane that we were gonna we we're gonna have a meeting on the tarmac at the airport. Now that's first of all, it's almost impossible to get the airport people to let you do that. Right? Yeah. But it was a charter, so we went to the charter place or the charter part of the airport and didn't pull up to the gate. We stopped about 100 yards from the gate and they let everybody off the plane that held the players and, and the coaches, the, the plane that held the families and the boosters and the other people, you know, the other people that went, went on to the gate. We all got off the airport and standing on the tarmac at Honolulu Airport, June said, I'm going to leave. And I mean, like I, I was like, I got kicked right in the gut. And, um, so, so all of a sudden, what happens during that time is all of a sudden guys start jockeying for position, right? Like, yeah. obviously, somebody's going to be the new head coach. You know, the, so anyway, the guy that, and I found out later, he, he, had, he had been working behind the scenes since he heard that June was going to leave. He gets the job. Well, he ain't June Jones, and I ain't working for anybody but June Jones. So um, I decided I made a really hard decision to uproot my family and go to Dallas, which is a place I've never been. I'm not a big fan of Texas, you know, I just, you know, anyway, but we went and um, what we stepped into was um, really, really a unique situation because when you see SMU, SMU is, and, and I heard it, 
I heard a guy describe SMU like this. SMU is that really pretty girl that you see from a distance. And then when you go up to talk to her, she got like some problem with her teeth or, you know, whatever. Right. And that's really what it was. I mean, it was, it's an unbelievably beautiful campus. It is got all kinds of money. It's got everything that it takes to win beautiful stadium on camp. It, all, it had everything we didn't have at Hawaii, except it didn't have a culture of winning. It had a culture of losing and excuse making and fault finding and kingdom building and all the things that make it hard to win in football. And so we first thing we had to do the first year was just get that culture changed right and we weren't 111 trying to do it and there were a few players on campus because it's a beautiful school and you could you know you can recruit there but you know human nature is so interesting when the death penalty came football was so big on that campus and it was so like it's a school of like 5,000 people right and football had become so big on that campus and so important that when they screwed it up and the death penalty came, the academicians, the people, you know, they, like they saw their opportunity to seize control of the campus and football became that evil thing that we have to put up with right. in Texas, but we really don't want to have a football program. And, you know, the death penalty this is why i believe it will never ever happen again because there have been schools that have had worse way worse problems than smu had um and multiple violations and all of it that i think the ncaa saw what it did you know yeah. it just completely decimated that program for i don't know 25 30 years until we finally got to a bowl game our second year and that had been the first bowl game they'd gotten to since the mid eighties. And you know, what was 2008, nine was, was our first bowl game. Yeah. They hadn't, they hadn't been to a bowl game since the mid eighties, you know, and, you know, so to give the school back and the alumni back and the, the people that cared about football to give them back something to be proud of. I can remember we played ironically, our first bowl game was the Hawaii bowl against Colin Kaepernick in Nevada. And we go over and we're the biggest bowl underdog of that season. And we beat them by like 30 points. And I just remember seeing alumni that had played at SMU in the stands, tears running down their face because there's, they were back, you know, they could feel good that they could say, I played at SMU, you know, and now, you know, you look at what that school's doing now when, and, uh, Spike Dykes' son, uh, Sonny Dykes, is, is doing a great job, but he's built upon what, you know, what June changed, you know? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy for that place because it's a good place. It's, they're good people there. It, it kind of lost its way for a while. Yeah. No, that, that's what I was just about to say about, about the, uh, that particular bowl game. I think, um, yeah, it was the first one since 84 that SMU yeah. had done, um, which had been... Yeah. The Aloha Bowl against Notre Dame, that's, I think, yeah. in the stadium or something like that. So that's that was interesting. That kind of uh, things kind of go in full circle, and you know, going back to that particular location. Was it sort of um, was it emotional for you going back there for that bowl game? Yeah, because you know I had been away for a year, and um, initially we thought we were going to play Hawaii. And then I think they lost and they lost a game late in the year and, and ended up Nevada became the, the, the team that got the bid. And that would have really been something. I mean, that thing would have been sold out. You couldn't have been, you couldn't have put another person in the place if, if that had ha actually happened. Um, but I remember going like my son and I, you know, when you go to a bowl game, fam all the families travel and all that stuff. So my, my uh, youngest son and I, would go out every morning and surf at, at dawn before we would go to practice. And I just thought this is one of the things in your life that'll be that you'll you'll cling on to for the rest of your life. The moment 
when the two of you are on a board on a wave together in the morning, Diamond Head's right there in the distance and it's your home. And it was really, really special to me. Yeah. Really special. Yeah. Wow. So at your time at SMU, uh, you coached players such as Emmanuel Sanders, Cole Beasley, uh, Aldrich Robinson, um, who've all gone on to, of course, have you know long and successful NFL careers. What what were they like to coach at SMU? You know, it was interesting. I, I was I, Jeremiah Mazzoli, who's our quarterback, asked me the other day about that, and I said, you know, it wasn't just those three. It was, you know, uh, Darius Johnson, who as a rookie caught thirteen passes in a game for the Falcons, and then you know got himself kind of off track and, and was out of football a couple of years later, but a kid named Garrett Dieter from Southland, Indiana, who I recruited that's, you know, that's been with the chiefs for five years. I mean, we had a great group of kids. It was wonderful because they were all the same kind of guy. They all had different personalities, right? But they all loved to work. They were all smart. They all, you know, wanted to be great. And so they were easy to coach. They demanded, well, I use this term, they demanded to be coached. They wanted to get better. They came to work every day. They were fun guys to be around. Uh, Cole Beasley is one of the funniest, um, really, really great kids you'll ever ever meet in your life. Emmanuel was the same way. And to this day, I love to pieces. And Aldrich was that way too. I mean, they were all just a really special, special group of kids. And... You know, you can imagine what it's like going from the places that they came from. You know, Aldrich was from Waxahachie, Texas. Uh, Emmanuel Sanders was from Belleville, Texas, right? Uh, Cole was from uh, New uh, Little Elm, Texas. I mean, these are small, small communities. Like, you know, and then all of a sudden they go to college and, you know, June starts to teach them like they're pro receivers and they're learning a system that's like, um, and they just sucked it up and it became theirs. And, and it's, it's amazing when you're, when you're in the, that offense and you're coaching receivers, there comes a time in the offense where they believe that it didn't matter who we were playing. They couldn't cover them. I mean, we play Texas a and we play any of those big school can't cover us, can't cover us, you know, just because, this the system is so amazing and it's so receiver friendly and um, you know that gave us a chance to do things like go to TCU who was a top 25 program and that's a bitter rivalry game it's called the iron skillet and uh, to go over there and beat them at their place right I mean that should never happen because they've got a lot of things they were big 12 team I mean all that stuff we went over there and beat them. So we, we were able to play beyond, you know, and then we, we did a great job of recruiting. Zach Line was a kid that we recruited out of Michigan, was a high school a high school linebacker, but was a state championship wrestler. He came to us, and June made him a fullback and played seven years in the NFL as a fullback. He's still the second leading rusher in the history of SMU to Eric Dickerson. And that was a kid that was – Nobody else recruited, but June saw what he wanted in that year. Tough, physical, smart football player. And he turned that guy into an NFL pro. We took Kelvin Beecham from Mahia, Texas, who was a basketball player and not very strong. And, you know, this, not very this, not very that. 6'3", not 6'5", you know, short arms, not long arms. All the things that you know, there were a lot of reasons to say no but June loved the way he competed and he loved his feet. Kelvin Beecham has been a starter in the NFL for now for, I don't know what is nine, 10 years. So, you know, we did what, you know, we found in some of it, you know, you just got to get lucky every once in a while. We found uh, Marcus Hunt, who's been an NFL player for a long time in our own weight room. He was there because he was a, a foreign exchange student from Estonia learning how to throw the hammer. You know, and with with this with this weight coach from from SMU, and you know our Dennis McKnight, our offensive line coach, met the kids. Said, "Why don't we give him a tryout?" And you know, we all said, "Well, you know, he's six nine, and he's two hundred seventy pounds, and we ran a forty, he ran four eight, and we got oh shoots." He didn't know even how to put his pants on when he started. 
but he grew, you know, he got coached and he grew and, and the next thing you know, he's drafted and he plays in the league and, you know, he's, I don't know, he's a millionaire now because, you know, he kind of fell in our lap and we took a chance. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Um, during your time at SMU, uh, the Mustangs signed 11 players from uh, Louisiana. Um, mm-hmm. Did your ties to the state when you worked at Louisiana Tech in 2003 play a role in this at all? Yeah, it did. Um, because I had started to know those high school coaches down there and I knew how good the high school football was. It was really tough. That was, there was a, there was a, you know, um, there was a subcurrent at SMU that didn't want Louisiana kids and it was inside of our own program. And it's, it's kind of unfortunate because, you know, some of those kids, uh, you look at a kid like, uh, Joey Fontana, who we recruited out of uh, brother Martin in, in New Orleans. And, you know, we had to beat Stanford and Nebraska to get it. And he came and he was going to be a really good offensive line, but we, but we redshirted him his first year because it wasn't strong enough yet, right? Like most offensive linemen. And we were at the point where we could now start to redshirt kids, right? Which is really important and develop a player. And we're at the bowl practice. And it's the last bowl practice before we get on a plane to go to Hawaii. And Joey, so we let all the all the young kids have a kind of like a scrimmage, right? And that's the advantage that you get of going to a bowl game. You get another, it's like having an additional spring practice. You get another 15 or 16 practices. Right. And Joey, somebody lands on his leg in a pile and you hear this scream. And he had one of the most horrific knee injuries I've ever seen. And Joey never, Joey never played it down for us. Right. And so it was really unfortunate. And, you know, there was a kid that we recruited named Richardson out of uh, out of Baton Rouge that we beat Michigan on to get and played. He played really good for for us as a for as a young corner. And then uh, I left, and I don't know what happened. To uh, you know, it's it, it's it was unfortunate because some of those kids, you know because they weren't Texas kids. And there was a real strong thing about they wanted Texas kids. Right. And then the next head coach came in and he was a Texas high school coach who had gone to Clemson and was the offensive coordinator at Clemson came back. And so he said, we're not, we're not, we're not recruiting anywhere but Texas. And so those kids ended up leaving the program. Garrett Dieter, who, like I said, I recruited, um, he came, in June's last year and had a great year. And then when the new coaching staff came in, he left because he knew they weren't going to play. Anybody wasn't from Texas. Well, the kid goes to Bowling Green, has a tremendous career, transfers for a year at Alabama, you know, starter at, on a uh, team that's playing for the national championship in Alabama. And like I said, is that a five, you know, been in the NFL for five years, but they had a different idea. They wanted only Texas kids. And, and it hurt them, and now they're back recruiting not not only in Texas but everywhere. And it's it's what you need to do because you're not going to get the best of best of the Texas kids because they're going to go to the big Texas schools or they're going to go to the SEC. Yeah. Most of the time. <laughs> um. So another earlier in your career, you'd you'd worked uh, at Ivy League universities. Just quickly, mm-hmm. sort of, how was it? kind of coaching at Penn and Dartmouth in comparison to, you know, the other universities that you've worked at? You know, Alex, I, coaching's coaching, you know, and I, and I would coach kids the same way if I was coaching at, the, you know, uh, like the, you know, Bristol Aztecs or the, you know, what, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, uh, it, it's coaching's coaching. And the thing about the Ivy League kids was, First of all, most of them were really highly competitive kids because they were competitive in the classroom. You know, yes. it's hard to get into those schools. So yet you have to learn how to work and, and those kind of things. Their priorities were different, right? They knew they weren't going to be, most of them knew they weren't going to be professional football players, but they, but they still wanted to have a great experience. So I enjoyed those kids. They were really obviously smart. And so you could do some things schematically with them 
that you couldn't do with other kids because they couldn't process the information. Well, Ivy League kids don't have a problem processing the information. Sometimes they have a problem running as fast to the ball as you want them to run because that's just the way it is. But, you know, when we were at, um, we were at Penn, we won a championship. It was funny. We won a championship the year I was at Dartmouth. And then we were at Penn. We Our first team went undefeated. Um, and, and won a championship and we went down to Navy and beat Navy. Um, and then the last team, then we went four and six the next year. Then we came back and went nine and one the next year. So, you know, we won an awful lot of games with those kids and they were great kids to coach and it was fun. And it was, you know, it was, recruiting was different because you had to recruit the whole nation because there just aren't very many kids with that academic profile. Yeah. And you, but it was fun to recruit those kids like and realize what it, what that school could do for them right like i'll tell you the story of a kid i recruited out of st louis named brian keys and brian had come to us um, and he was you know he was a good student in his school but he wasn't an outstanding student and he had a lot of things going against him you know single parent family not in very good neighborhood not, but, but not, 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 not all the stuff, right? But I remember when sitting with his mother when we were recruiting him, and I, and I said, I don't know if he can get in school. I really don't. But if Brian would come to Penn, his life is going to change forever. And your life will change. And I said, and it won't be because he's a professional football player, but it'll be because the opportunities that the schools want to provide for him. And there was an alumnus that we had in St. Louis, Jim Dunsmore. And Jim really championed the kid. He wrote the, because they, they initially declined his application. Right. And then, then they appealed it. And Jim wrote a very passionate, long letter. And that was back in the days when he wrote letters, he didn't do it by video conferencing, about how important he thought a pen experience could be for Brian. And, and, you know, Brian was a kid that deserved that opportunity, you know, after all the things. Well, anyway, so long story short, they give him a chance to get in. He's like the last to admit, right? And he comes and he does phenomenal in the classroom. He does, I think at one time, I don't know if it's still hold, but at once, at one time, he was the second leading rusher in the history of the league to Ed Marinero, who had, you know, been a Heisman Trophy guy. Um, and, and, you know, he never played a down in pro football, but he was a phenomenal high school, college player, won three Ivy League championships, and now works on Wall Street and is, you know, very, very well off and very, very successful and all that. So the fun part about being in that league was you would see what that school could do for kids. You know, yeah. and we, had a, we had a few pro football players to come out of that school and, and you know, and that's great, but that wasn't the mission. The mission was to help these guys become you know, successful entrepreneurs, doctors, lawyers, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, just sort of moving on to, to general uh, college football, um, are there any particular sort of game day atmospheres that have stuck in your mind? Every one. Every <laughs> Every single one, because every one of them has a unique thing, you know, like yeah. for me it was, at Hawaii, it was, you know, waking up in the morning and taking a surfboard and, and surfing Waikiki and then going back to the hotel where you'd have, the, because the games were always at night, we would have a, we'd have brunch about 11, they'd let the players sleep in, I'd go surf, come back to the hotel about 11, we'd have brunch, have meetings, get on the bus, and go to the hotel, go to the stadium, and pulling up at the stadium at UH where everybody's out tailgating, you know, it's families, and, and go into the stadium that um, you, know, you come out and there they have this, there's a plant called the tea plant. It's not T E A, it's T I. And in Hawaiian culture, you wave those leaves to ward off evil spirits, right? So the fans wave, you know, 60,000 people waving tea leaves, you know, at, at the opponent when they come out on the field and yeah. they, they play 
they play the, the theme from Hawaii Five O, and they they have a surfboard where the male cheerleaders have a, have the board up on their like on their shoulders with about five of them, six of them. And then there's a girl up on the surfboard and she comes into the stadium like she's paddling and they run her into the stadium while they're going playing Hawaii Five O. Then she gets up and you know, mounts her it's it's phenomenal. It's so unique and it's so Hawaii, right? And yeah. the, Billy the Warrior and you know, like Billy the Warrior is an iconic character. His 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 son, Braden, actually played for the Chargers last year, right? And he's a big Polynesian guy. He's actually a Tom, yeah. he's a huge guy. And my youngest son uh, was about 12 at that time. He has a he has all of his sons were drummers for him in their little entourage, right? So he had and Braden was his youngest son, was the same age as my youngest son. They got to be buddies. So <laughs> Billy gave my son uh, like a ia, which is a like a grass ia. It's like a native grass skirt, I guess is the best way to describe it. Right. Painted him all up, right? And let him drum with his with his sons. So you see huge brown Billy, and then all these little brown kids. And then at the end, there'd be this little blonde white kid. Right? <laughs> so that was a huge, huge thrill for me. Going to Alabama and, you know, standing in that stadium. And then all of a sudden you hear this voice, this gravelly voice. And then all on the on the jumbotron, all of a sudden, there's the face of Bear Bryant, yeah. and he's talking about Alabama football. And then they go the opening guitar riff to "Sweet Home Alabama," right? Resonates through the stadium, and those people go absolutely bonkers, and they play "Sweet Home Alabama." You know, I told you the story about Mike the Tiger at LSU. I mean, Michigan State was huge to me because as a kid when we lived in South Bend, my dad loved Michigan State's band. So every time Michigan State would come in and play Notre Dame, which is a big rival game, we would go and Michigan State's band would put on a free concert at the steps of the library at Notre Dame. Then they would march into the stadium, right? And they play this real special drum line as they march, right? And so we would march into the stadium behind them until they went down into the stadium. And then, you know, we and so when we played Michigan State, you know, they come, they come, Michigan State, the, it's a long tunnel to go into the stadium and the visitors locker rooms here and the Michigan State locker rooms here. Well, we go out before, you always go out before the other home team, right? So, but the band is coming through that tunnel playing that same drum line that I remember yeah. as a kid. And so I walked into the stadium behind the band and that was, amazing amazing thrill usc i mean you talk about all of them i mean they every everyone has its own uniqueness and um you know wyoming you go up to wyoming and, and you know they play that song cowboy joe and uh, you know i mean it's just college football you know college football is so full of incredible incredible traditions and unique things that each school you know whether it's you know like enter the Sandman at Virginia Tech or, you know, University of South Carolina where they shut the lights off and they play the theme, the theme from, you know, 2001, uh, uh, you know, Space Odyssey or whatever it is. I mean, it's just so many, many things. Jump around at Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, they're, they're everywhere, right? <laughs> and on that topic, uh, would you like to return to college football one day? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I I, I I think I would like that experience again to coach young kids, and watch them grow. And there are a couple of things about college football right now that concern me. Right. You know, the transfer portal thing. I think yeah. the and I the NIL thing can it, it could be really tragic for the game as a whole because I think what it's going to do it's going to further separate the Alabamas and the Notre Dames and the Michigans and the USC's of the world from you know the smus and the san jose states and frankly from the kansas states and the you know yeah. washington states and you know yeah. the schools that just don't have that kind of financial wherewithal 
because it's going to turn into a you know who, it's going to turn into a battle. bidding war kind of thing yeah who can sponsor a kid who, you know, who can provide the kid with the best sponsors well yeah alabama's got a million guys lined up to, to get money right yeah and and or, or it's going to end up like it happened at smu where you know one guy says i want to win the national championship and i'm i'm funding this thing and you know and i think it's just i don't, I don't think that's i think it's against the spirit of college sports but you know it's what's happened because so many people have litigated that the players should get you know financial returns yeah yeah it's interesting because I was, I was going to ask the question do you think in some respects a program like hawaii could maybe benefit from a new kind of nil landscape at all well i think i think what would what, what have to happen in hawaii and hawaii is because yes but hawaii right now is struggling so bad financially you know because covid has dealt the economy a body blow it's a tourist economy and when people don't come you know, everybody suffers and so right now um you know it, it's it's i don't know where that money is that you would you would be able to say okay uh, let's say it's the sheridan hotels or whatever that are that is willing to come up with that kind of thing i i just don't know i i why doesn't have the donor power that some of these other places have right where they either have so many alumni out and, and football is so important to those guys that they're going to pay you know, like you know the money that it that would take or that they've got a you know corporations that are run by Hawaii graduates that say, okay, we're going to, this is going to be the, you know, I don't know, Avis rent a car that is going to sponsor, you know, 10 guys or whatever. Yeah. I think, I think that it's going to be interesting because what's going to happen is you're going to have a real, you're going to have a real problem in that right now, the way title nine works, which is the, which is the thing of gender equity. If you give a scholarship, to a boy, you got to give a scholarship to a girl. There has to be representation, equal representation. What happens when you start giving football players and NIL money? Do you have to do it now for the basketball, with girls basketball team? Yeah. Well, you know, that can get real expensive. Yeah. So I, I think I think we've opened a can of worms that you know it'll be three or four or five years before we find out whether it's going to work or not. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, another recent update to the college football world is the news that, that Texas and Oklahoma are leaving the Big 12 and, and moving to the SEC in the next couple of years. I'd kind of be interested to hear your thoughts on, on whether you think the Big 12 could sort of weather the storm and continue successfully as a Power 5 conference and, and whether just in general you think that's necessarily a good thing for the college football landscape. Well, I go back to the day when the Big 8 was Nebraska, Colorado, Oklahoma, Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, that that big eight. Well, that started to crumble when Nebraska went to the Big Ten, you know, um, and, you know, Texas was in the Big 12 because the Southwest Conference had disbanded. I, I think you look at it and I don't know where the, I, I don't know where the Big 12 goes to get more power players because they've already lost Colorado to the Pac-12. They lost Nebraska to the Big Ten. Yeah. Now they've lost Texas to uh, the SEC. They've lost Texas A&M to the SEC. You lose Oklahoma to the SEC. Who's left? I mean, you know, I know that there are some schools that have applied to, to get into the Big 12, but they're not, you know, they're, they're I think SMU probably should try and yeah. get into the Big 12 because it's the Dallas Metroplex yeah. TV market. Houston is another team that maybe sh should go that way because the All-America Conference that, that right now, there's there's so few geographic and natural rivalries. Right? Yeah. So, for example, Marshall and SMU or Connecticut and SMU, those, are, that, that, those don't make sense, right? Yeah. So, but Houston, SMU, SMU, TCU, SMU, Kansas State would make more sense than going sure. the other way. 
So I think they're going to have to they're going to have to find a way to to find power players because there aren't very many of them out there. Why would you leave the Big Ten? Because the Big Ten network is so gives you so much money. Why would you leave the Pac-12? Wouldn't do it. Pac-12 network, SEC network, television drives it all. And so yes. uh, right now the Big 12 is not. I mean Kansas, Kansas State. They don't have. You got Kansas City. That's not a major media market. Yeah. Uh, Iowa State. And there's nothing that names Iowa. They yeah. need they need a major television markets, and that would be Dallas and Houston. Yeah, yeah. That that was actually going to be my follow up question. I was going to kind of argue the point why SMU would make a lot of sense. Um, I mean, yeah, as you're saying, it's it's the it's the TV market dictates all of this. Um, but then I I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking too positively on it, but. You look at a program like Nebraska, I mean, since it's moved to the Big Ten, it hasn't had any success whatsoever. I mean, they're essentially the doormat of the that that um, that conference. Um, I mean, people like to talk about the Nebraska kind of heyday, and but that seems to be a very distant memory. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I don't know, would maybe a program like that just, would they be, would the Big 12 be able to lure someone like that back? If you just simply look at it from the perspective of maybe Nebraska's AD or someone like well we just it hasn't worked I know we might be getting in some TV money but at the end of the day we need to win football games and would we have a better chance of doing that going back and being the big flagship program again of that old conference I don't know but that's I think that's one way to look at it and certainly you know um, I'm sure they're concerned about their inability to win but when you look at what they you know they still put ninety thousand people in the stadium yeah and they and they get all the benefits of being in a power five conference because for every and this is this is really nebraska doesn't if they don't even go to a bowl game right they are still going to get bowl revenue because when michigan and penn state and michigan state and i whoever yeah go all of that money is then disseminated out amongst all the schools yeah. and so whether and that's basketball tournaments that's ncaa bowl games that's television revenue so it's it would make more sense to me for nebraska to up the ante and figure out how to how to how to become as successful as iowa is there's no reason that Nebraska with its tradition and its facilities. And I understand it's isol- geographically isolated. There's not a lot of players in your state, all that stuff. Well, there's not a lot of players in Minnesota. There's not a lot of players in Wisconsin. There's not a lot of players in Iowa. Indiana doesn't have great high school football. <clears throat> I think what, what Nebraska's got to do is step up competitively and figure out inside the organization what it is that's keeping them from having – the opportunity to at least win eight games a year. And that, to me, you look at who you play. Northwestern, you should be. Iowa, you should be. Minnesota, you should be. Wisconsin's going to be a handful. Purdue, you should be. You know, you ought to be able to play with Michigan State every week. Um, You know, so I think that's, you know, then you go east and you get Rutgers and Maryland. You You ought to beat those people. How do you see the brand of college football developing in the U.K.? You know, um, certainly with a lot of these big name programs that we've discussed, uh, it, it seems that, you know, with NFL growing in Europe and, and the UK, uh, you know, and people, you know, someone from London who's never been to Green Bay, Wisconsin has become a Packers fan. I mean, when you talk about college football, look at someone like myself. I'm 4,675 miles from Baton Rouge, never been there, but I've become a massive fan. So sort of how do you see college football do you see it becoming big in the in Europe and the UK? Yeah, I do. I do. I think. I think it's. I think the fans are fans, and fans love uh, association with something that that you know, for whatever reason, it moves them. Right? Why was it you? Was it was it the tiger eye in the middle of the stadium? Was it the purple and gold uniforms? Was it some? You know, what was it? I mean, but it moved you, and it, I've noticed this with the CFL. We've got bunch of fans in the UK now because all of a sudden you know they started to see it on BT Sport and they go wow I like that game 
you know, or I like those uniforms or whatever it is. Like I became a Leeds United fan because I love their uniforms when I saw them on TV for the first time in 19, 1993, right? right. I, didn't, I didn't know. I mean, I knew that if you hit the ball into the net, it was good. And if they hit it into your net, it's bad. But that was my extent of my soccer knowledge. And I'm not much better yet, but I love Leeds, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I think fans are fans. I'm one, you're one. We're all fans of something. And, you know, that, it'll, it could be that one thing that moves you. Jump around when they see that phenomenon for the first time at a Wisconsin game. And they go, holy shit, I'm a Badger fan. Right? Yeah. Or I'm a, you started out as a Packer fan, but I watched Wisconsin play because I wanted to, you know, the more exposure the fans get to college football and the uniqueness of college football and the traditions of college football and all of it, I think that it will just continue to grow. And the byproduct will be the growth of the indigenous game in England, because you already look, there's 200 and some colleges and universities in, in the UK that play football. Yeah. They'll start to figure it out. You know, yeah. Piggyback on. Sure. Um, and your show, Coffee with Coach, um, have you got anything just to tell viewers of this? Tell them about it. I mean, I'm going to link it in the description below anyway. Well, it's, it's really something that we started during the pandemic when I was living on living with my brother. We got I went over to see my brother in Hawaii, and the pandemic hit, and they they stopped all travel for five months. So I was living with my brother, and he said to me one day, he goes, "Let's do a podcast." I said, "Well, I don't." Know. He said, "No, come on, let's do a podcast." And it started on his front porch in the morning, just having coffee and talking about football. And now it's turned into something really pretty cool, and it's a it's a fan interactive show. With, Every Tuesday, we'll be on live tonight, uh, and we deal with all things football, whether it's college football or pro football, but it focuses primarily on the NFL. We have all kinds of wonderful guests. We've had everything from you know, vice presidents of the NFL to NFL players to college players to you know, all kind of crazy stories, and, and kind of, it's, it's just really a, a lot of fun for an hour to get on and interact with the fans, because we want it to be really interactive. Sure. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you so much for your time, Jeff. It's, it's been great hearing your insight and, and your career. Alex, it's been my pleasure, man. And, and uh, it's awesome to sit and, and uh, chop it up with a guy that really, really, really loves college football because college football is truly a unique, unique thing. And I encourage more people to get into it because you can catch more and more games all the time on uh, BT Sport and the ESPN Family Networks. Thank you.